Good afternoon. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, Albert, for inviting me for being here. Uh, it's an interesting uh, conference. And uh, I myself, I have learned a lot of stuff in the, the previous presentations. Uh, so I'm Paul Cortez. I'm an associate professor at the University of Minho, which is in the north of the country. Uh, I work at Guimarães, which is a, a lovely medieval city where uh, the king, Afonso Henrique, um, uh, spent a lot of time and from there he, he built this, this country. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about the, the age of intelligent uh, data systems. Uh, I'll try to do a brief introduction, try not to repeat some of the things that have already been said uh, and try to focus more on some application examples. Um, so, how does this work? So, sorry. I need to, do you know how this, oops. Okay, thank you. So, um, in terms of the introduction, so all of you have listened to the rise of artificial intelligence. Uh, it has been uh, through the 50s and the 60s, but uh, more recently there have been some really interesting uh, milestones. Uh, you already heard about IBM Watson. Um, uh, more recently, Google AlphaGo using a kind of a mixture between heuristics and deep learning. They have built a system that was capable of being, uh, beating a good uh, a Go player, which is a, a Chinese chess. Um, so uh, artificial intelligence is there to come. Um, and um, artificial intelligence includes a lot of things. Um, it can include uh, natural language processing, uh, multi-agent systems, uh, knowledge understanding, reasoning, and so on. Uh, I myself have been working more with um, machine learning and metaheuristics. Uh, with machine learning, you can do interesting things from data. One of them is to uh, uh, empower machines with prediction capabilities. And with metaheuristics, you can do optimization. You can maximize and minimize several goals. Um, and this can be linked with business intelligence, which is mostly interested with supporting decisions uh, within an organization. Um, and one of the ways to do this is to combine both these things, combine prediction and optimization. And there's this concept of adaptive business intelligence that I'll also talk a little bit about and show some examples. So um, all of you already know this, there's been a rise in data. Um, in Berkeley, they, in 2003, they, they, they came up with this project which was funded, uh, where they tried to measure how much info uh, using several um, measures like uh, data stores in computational devices and things like that. So you can see that there's a, there was a, a huge increase and, and trend. Uh, more recently, uh, in the last week, there was this news at uh, TechCrunch where they say that IBM estimated that 90% of the data that exists nowadays was produced only in the last two years. And in 2020, the, 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 the amount of data will grow from 4.4 zettabytes to 44 zettabytes. So we are collecting a lot of the data. We have lots of sources like the, the web, social networks, the Internet of Things, Industry 4.0, smart cities, and other things. Some of the data is produced by humans, other, other sources of data is produced by devices. And we need this data to keep the world run, running. We need to pay salaries, we need to understand if a patient has a disease or not, we need to detect fraud, we need to do all of these things. Uh, but on top of that, once we collect this data, we can try to analyze it and see if we can support decision. And so there are, even in terms from a research point of view and in the academy and the, the universities and research centers, they come up with these uh, different amounts of uh, terms and there's some hype with this, these terms and they change a little bit through the ages. Um, I'm showing a timeline uh, that, uh, uh, that pictures, uh, for example, if you consider machine learning, it started in the 50s and the 60s 
uh, after it, it was only uh, known within the universities, but nowadays there's a, a new hype behind ma uh, machine learning, probably because uh, things like deep learning started to achieve very interesting uh, pattern re recognition results. Um, there are also uh, other teams that are very f similar. They are slightly different. It depends on the angle, the perspective that you're trying, to, what you are trying to accomplish, like decision support systems, where the goal is to, to support decisions. Um, um, Metaheuristics were also proposed in the 60s, but as, as time has passed by in the 90s, uh, we started calling these things analytics, data mining, business intelligence. More recently, the term big data and data science started to arise. And in 2006, Mikhail Vix has proposed this adaptive business intelligence. Um, so what is business intelligence? Probably most of you already know this, but I'll just give a short summary. You can call this uh, analytics, decision support systems, data science. The goal is to analyze raw data and uh, try to infer if there's useful knowledge that you can use to support decisions. And to do this, you can use lots of things like architectures, tools, different methods, databases. Um, uh, there are standard uh, business um, intelligence tools that you can buy that typically uh, are customized and they, they try to build up a, a data warehouse, which is a, a sophisticated way to collect data from different sources uh, oriented towards business goals. And on top of that, you can do data mining to extract some knowledge and you can also look at KPIs and build dashboards to see how is your organization running up. Uh, and this allows you to understand what is the past and what is the current uh, present. Um, <clears throat> Gartner Group uh, every year uh, publishes this mag magic quadrant where they position a lot of tools and, and technologies that have been used for business intelligence. Uh, I'm not sure if this quadrant includes the APIs, but it gives you a, 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 an idea that uh, there are several tools in the market and some of them are more easy to use than, than others. Um, uh, in 2005, th there was this Rexer group that uh, did an extensive data science survey where they analyzed um, responses for, from analytical uh, prof professionals, and they come up with the, some highlights, and one of them was the rise of the R tool. And I'm showing this because I'm a fan of R, uh, and it's open source. Anybody here can use it if you try to, to learn it. Um, in 2016, the IEEE Insti uh, organization, they, they have this ranking. I don't know how the, they build up this ranking, but they, 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 they build this ranking of computer languages. And for me, it's amazing to see that R is in fifth place because R only does data analysis. It does, it's not suited for real-time embedded systems with the distribution and, and things like that. So it's quite used for data analysis. Um, recently, there's a other uh, uh, programming language, which is Python, that also has been uh, really used. And there's also this recent debate, is Python better than R? Is R better than Python? Well, um, I'm not sure because I, I don't know that much about Python. I know a, a little bit about R. I even wrote this book, Modern Optimization with R, which was published by Springer. If you want, you can buy it. Um, and explains with some recipes how to do optimization. Um, and here I'm showing some results, uh, data analysis results. Anyway, this is a tool that I use. Uh, I'm not saying it's the best tool to use, but uh, as an example, Microsoft uh, has embedded R into their, their API system, and Azure can use R if, if, if you want to. So um, what is adaptive business intelligence? Uh, Mikhailovic, which is uh, a professor in Australia, uh, he came up with this concept, which is quite easy uh, but, um, to understand, but sometimes to implement it, it, it requires some tailoring because it's uh, domain specific. But the idea here is that uh, if you um, analyze data, if you do analytics, if you do even data mining, you can come up, come up with interesting knowledge, but knowledge doesn't necessarily translate into a decision. And I can give you an example. If you do a lot of uh, data crunching and you extract one rule that says 
70% of your sales are in Lisbon and only 30% uh, percent of the sales are in Porto. That, that might be interesting if you didn't knew this, but so what? How can you translate this to a decision? Should you close your shops in Porto? Should you uh, uh, do things in Porto in a different way? Should you move everything to Lisbon? Should you try to do another thing? This type of knowledge doesn't uh, give you that sort of insight. So sometimes there's a, a huge gap between and having some analytics and doing the, the, the decisions that, that transform into actions. So the idea um, of adaptive business intelligence is to uh, add two models. One is prediction and the other is optimization uh, to the, the, the business intelligence system. And with prediction, what you do is to Using the past data, you try to analyze patterns and regularities, uh, things that uh, can generalize to the future, and uh, using a, a huge uh, amount of possibilities that you have in terms of machine learning. Uh, you can use decision trees, neural networks, deep learning, random forest, and whatsoever. Uh, if you do things right, the model is capable of generalizing uh, uh, rules that will uh, um, Obey in an inter uh, will um, predict in an um, interesting way for unseen data, and that's the value uh, behind that. Um, uh, and optimization um, is a, a little bit different. The, the idea is that you can have several options uh, or parameters, things that, uh, uh, it's a search space that uh, you, you define and depend on the problem. And uh, you need to find out what are the best options, what are the best parameters in this huge search space. Uh, and to do this, you can use, uh, 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 again, a uh, very uh, interesting array of uh, artificial intelligence techniques like simulated annealing, table search, genetic algorithms. Most of these uh, meta-heuristic techniques, they are inspired by nature. Um, and they, they, they do a, a kind of a clever heuristic way because they have few knowledge about the domain, but they, they, they build the, the, the solutions uh, in a way that the, the solutions are guided. Um, just to give you an example, um, in the second uh, um, plot that you have, you, I'm showing the search space, and you have over there uh, four different solutions. Each of them has a measure of quality that can be profit, for instance. And this, this is, these solutions that are, are searching in different spaces of this huge search space, they can exchange information and, uh, and you can combine this uh, uh, um, communication of information to look up and say, probably it's better to look at this space and not at that space. And by using this sort of techniques, uh, you can, um, optimize things, even if you have a huge number of uh, things that you want to test and to combine and to explore. Um, so um, now I'm going to show you uh, a couple of examples, not all of them, but a couple of examples that have been working through the last years. Uh, as a researcher, I've been working uh, around 20 years in artificial intelligence. And uh, after my PhD, I moved to an inf information systems department and the head of that information system said, okay, neural networks are interesting, but I want something that is useful for organizations. And uh, it, it made me think a little bit and say, okay, let's try to show the value of artificial intelligence in many domains. So that's a part of, um, of uh, um, a, a conducting line that, that followed my research. So one example, intensive care medicine. Um, intensive care medicine is very costly in terms of an hospital. Uh, only the critical ill uh, uh, patients go there. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's a very challenging domain. Uh, the patients are facing life or death and the physicians, they, they also have to make these very difficult uh, decisions. So um, my, um, uh, I participated in this project as an analyst and what we did was we tried to analyze uh, a series of four biometrics like the bl blood pressure, heart rate, uh, oxygen saturation that would m were measured continuously as milliseconds and things like that. Um, and uh, the physicians, they came up with this protocol for defining what is a normal range, what is a abnormal range. 
And by having this simple protocol, it was quite easy to define what is uh, um, adverse event. And we collected these daily adverse events and we tried to uh, correlate these adverse events with uh, some measurements of failure of six organ uh, systems, the, the, the heart, the, the lungs, uh, and the, 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 the liver and the renal thing and so on. And actually, um, we managed to, to achieve a satisfactory uh, correlation. Um, uh, I don't know if I have a point. Okay. I'll, uh, in the top middle, you have uh, an example of a rock curve, which was also uh, uh, show, uh, shown. But basically, the curve says that the, the, the classifier is capable of doing a good discrimination between uh, a normal and, and a dysfunction uh, condition. Um, and we, we published this uh, result in, in a very good uh, international journal, which was an interesting outcome. Um, in an, another completely different uh, application, wine quality, I worked with the, the Portuguese Institute that does certification of the Portuguese wine from my region, which is Vinho Verde. And people here, uh, they enjoy drinking it, especially in the summer when it's hot and, and the, the white wine. Um, and uh, the challenge that was uh, that the certification uh, uh, told me was that they had this uh, uh, data where the, um, uh, some very good wine experts did some uh, blind evaluations of the wine and they had to score uh, the quality of the, the, the wine. And they also had this laboratory physical uh, chemical tests where they measured the sulfates, the alcohol levels, pH uh, uh, levels and things like that. And they wanted to see if it was possible to correlate uh, just using the, the objective measures to, to identify the subjective uh, evaluation by the experts. And actually we did a, 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 an interesting um, correlation of these things and we even opened a little bit the, the box. It was not just showing that our method could deliver uh, a very good classification accuracy, but we also opened the, the, the box. And one way that we did was to provide a visual uh, graph that, that I um, proposed in, in research. And basically this graph considers two of the most important uh, features that the, the model uses, which is the, the alcohol and the sulfates. <coughs> And it analyzes um, what is the typical behavior of this learner when you change a little bit these uh, values. And what happens is that there's a, an interesting cluster of high quality wine, which is the dark area. So it's a very good wine. And it means that the alcohol should be between 11 and 12 degrees and the, free, uh, the, the sulfur dioxide should have low values. But also you have a very bad wine, which is the white cluster, which is very close. And to have a very bad wine, you just have to have a lower uh, amount of alcohol and a higher uh, amount of uh, sulfur dioxide. So this is an interesting thing because once you came up with this sort of diagrams, you can show this to the wine experts and ask them, does this make sense? Is, just, is this a... a, a um, an interesting outcome. What do you think about this? And uh, this is, was uh, um, a very interesting um, thing in the partnership between uh, uh, the, the data analysts and the wine experts because they, they found this very challenging. Uh, as a side mark, I would say that there's this UCI aspect. So what is UCI? It's a famous uh, public repository that was built by the California uh, Irvine uh, University, and anybody here can Google it, and uh, we donated the data set to UCI. So if you want, you can download the data to your laptop, and you can do your own data analysis on it. And actually, uh, the, the wine quality data set is on the top test of the most popular data sets that were donated to UCI, which for me it was an interesting outcome. Um, going on, uh, a student of mine was working at the bank and he wanted to do a PhD. Uh, so uh, he started to analyze this uh, problem of doing uh, bank telemarketing. And uh, the idea was uh, uh, the, the, a particular bank, they made a series of marketing campaigns where they did some phone calls and they uh, tried in a polite way uh, with, with some commercial aspect, of course, they tried to convince some of their clients to uh, make a long-term deposit. 
So you have a lot of amount in your account. Why not do this uh, long-term deposit because we have an interesting rate or something like that. And we try to, to see if we could predict or not this, um, this uh, buying of long-term deposits. And in the first exercise, we did really well, but the problem is that we used features that were only uh, known after the call was issued. So it was not a realistic thing. And in his PhD, he has uh, rethink this exercise from scratch, uh, trying to use features that will, were known before the call was made. And to do that, he did a lot of feature engineering. He, he did uh, some um, uh, interviews with bank specialists. He tried to uh, uh, made uh, a lot of hypotheses. And this led to a very interesting um, way of uh, selecting some features. Um, and after his work, we managed to, to publish in, in a top journal, which is Decision Support Systems in, in this area. Uh, and uh, we came up with a model which was a, a, a neural network that was capable to uh, have 80% accuracy if we only select half of the clients. Uh, and this result was much better uh, um, than we had at the beginning of his PhD. And again, uh, if you want, you can access this data. The only thing is that this is not the original data. We only donated a partial uh, version of the data because the banking has some privacy issues. Um, in another PhD student that is almost finishing and working with me, he's working in text mining and sentiment analysis, and he tried to analyze the, the opinions of investors. Uh, investors, they message a lot uh, as well, and they use several platforms like Twitter, and there's this specialized platform called Stock Tweets, where you put your own opinion about the stock. And so there's lots of information, mostly uh, qualitative uh, information in text, and he did two interesting things in his PhD. The first one was, if you look just at the message that uh, an investor puts, can you detect if the, if the opinion is good or bad about a, a particular stock, which means, is it bullish? Uh, uh, is it something that you should buy or is it bearish? Um, and he invented a way that is very simple, that uses some statistical measures, but that allows you to build a lexicon with 20,000 um, terms. And if you want, you can access it. It's in G GitHub. We made it available so anybody can test this, this lexicon. And it was a lexicon that was built specifically for twi uh, Twitter kind of messages, which have short uh, acronyms and, and text, and for the stock market. And then after uh, uh, defining this, this specialized lexicon, we tried to check, uh, is it useful for doing predictions? Uh, in the stock market, can we predict returns, volatility, trading volume, or survey sentiment index, indexes, because there are traditional surveys that they ask companies and some individuals, what are their opinions about the stock market in general or some specific uh, thing? And um, the thing is that some of these surveys, they, they're only available on a weekly basis or monthly basis and our Twitter-based indicators, we can achieve them in real time. And actually, we, we, we did not uh, uh, find fantastic results and things like that, but in some specific cases, we have shown that the, the Twitter-based indicators are useful, and they can be used as a proxy to replace these um, survey sentiment indexes, which was uh, an interesting thing of his PhD. Um, another student of mine, which came from the civil engineering area, and so this was a, a multidisciplinary work, uh, he worked with uh, earthwork construction sites, like doing highways and things like that. And this is the first example that I'm showing you that is a true ABI system, because it does both prediction and optimization. So. Um, the, the, the task here is that he wanted to have some automated way to do the planning for construction works. And so there are several sites uh, you are seeing here, satellite, satellite images, 
image. And so there are several sites, and in some cases you need to cut uh, the, the, uh, and do some cutting and pick up the, the rocks and the dirt and put them in trucks, and then you need to move them to embankments, and then you have to put some compactors because you want the highway to be very uh, sta uh, stable with few inclination uh, and whatsoever. So this is a typical thing. Uh, the problem is that um, for uh, particular planning, we don't know in advance what is the best way to use all of these machines. Uh, and uh, if we use these machines, then of course we need some humans to drive them, at least nowadays. Maybe in the future this will be also automated. But anyway, how did we use uh, ABI for this? Well, we did, uh, we used machine learning and data mining to predict uh, the capabilities of each individual equipment to know what is its efficiency uh, in this particular type of terrain with these characteristics, how well will it work? So we use prediction for that. And then, having on this information, we did optimization uh, where we had two goals. One was to reduce the duration of the project and the other was to reduce the cost. But there's a trade-off because if you want to reduce really reduction, then the cost increases and if you uh, allow to increase uh, the, the duration, maybe the cost will reduce, but you cannot afford to, to uh, do a construction site uh, if you do not meet the, the deadlines and things like that. So uh, he actually um, used a multi-objective uh, system which, which used this NSGA2 algorithm where he combined these predictions and all of these things and at the end, he came up with this interesting Pareto curve which shows the best trade-offs that you can have. And then we compared this with the human planning because we, re we had the, the human uh, planning for this uh, task. And if this system was to be used, we could have huge savings in terms of both duration and cost. So this was also an interesting application in terms of ABI. Another interesting application of ABI is this one. Uh, it was a, a, a student project that I uh, was launching in a course that I was teaching and after that the students really liked the work so I, I convinced them to, let's write a paper about this and we started uh, uh, some work and this work won in 2015 the best paper for the EPIA conference which is a major uh, conference here in Portugal related with artificial intelligence. And uh, what the, the, we, we did in this work was to analyze a huge number, uh, uh, was around 40,000 online news from this Mashable service. I don't know if you know Mashable. And um, analyzing the, the, the news, uh, what we tried to do first was prediction. Try to see if we could predict if a particular news would be popular or not in terms of the number of shares. But the challenge was we wanted to do this uh, knowing only information that was available prior to putting the, the news online. Because after that it's more easy, you can collect how many shares are uh, user see per hour the next day and so forth. But we did this before knowing uh, if the news were, were published or not. And uh, using some text mining features we managed to uh, get a reasonable discrimination around 70 to 80 percent, which was quite good. And the next thing was to do optimization. And by optimization, we thought of doing some kind of uh, decision support. So uh, imagine that you want to, to produce some online news. So you built you, your own draft. And then you could submit to the system. And the idea of the system was to guide you to improve its popularity. How? The system will test using optimization different uh, combinations that are slightly different from the, the original use that you have and the system will try to check what would be the popularity if your title is a little bit short or if you include another picture or another image or if you include as a keyword something that you already have in your text but you didn't remember to put it as a keyword but in the past other articles had put as a keyword. And uh, what we came up with was this uh, design of this uh, model that has uh, 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 a huge in inter um, connection between data extraction and processing, uh, prediction and optimization. And this is done automatically in an iterative way because if we want to do optimization, we need to check new features and to check uh, the popularity of these 
features in the past. We need to go back to the data extraction. But all of this is done automatically. And at the end, we, we shown with some robustness uh, in all these 40,000 uh, articles that we could, on average, increase the popularity of the articles by 50, uh, um, 15%, which was an interesting outcome. And uh, it was well received in this conference. Um, I'm just going to talk about my, uh, a very recent project that I'm being involved, which is a Portugal 2020 uh, project that is funded. It started a few months ago, uh, and I'll be working three years uh, with this, um, with uh, two PhD students and, and another colleagues of mine. And it's a very challenging problem where we will try to use ABI as well. We will try to do prediction and optimization. And it's very challenging because it involves big data, it involves real time, it involves classification, and we have lots of things going on. Um, what are we, what we're, we are going to do in this project is to work in a digital uh, market, which is very interesting. And the market works like this. So uh, if you have something that can bring an audience uh, to your smartphone or to your PDA or something like that, then you might want to get some revenue. Uh, and one way to get this revenue is that you can put a banner or a link or something like that in your blog or your, the place where you put some news. Um, there are different ways to, to do this, but this company, which is called uh, Ola Mobile, they work with this subscription service where uh, there are also uh, uh, a number of agents that are advertisers and they want to sell goods and they want to sell products. And typically, they want to sell a subscription, something that you pay every week or, or so. So each time a user that doesn't, is not aware of this, but each time a user that clicks a banner or clicks a link, um, this platform that is created by Ola Mobile tries to send the user to a particular advertiser and to do this match. Uh, and um, this is a market that is growing. It has millions of uh, transactions every day. Uh, they, are, they have transactions all over the world, and this is really big data. They have terabytes of data. Um, and what they want in this three-year project is to find a better way to match the, 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 the audience, the users, with the products such that they, they, uh, all of the players in this, this uh, ecosystem have some revenue. And we, we, we are working on this. And if everything goes uh, right, because research, we are not 100% uh, sure of things. We, we need to research what works well, what, what works uh, wrong. But I'm, I really hope that in the next three years, we will come up with some interesting algorithms and clever ways to, to, to respond to this particular market. Anyway. Um, I ended my talk. If you want, you can contact me by email. You can see my webpage, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Thank you.